BGMC. The biblical truth lives here. scriptures foretold of the anointed one, Yeshua HaMashiach. The Messiah Yeshua came to call the people back to the truth of His word and to follow that righteous path. Yeshua then called Jewish men to be His disciples, and after His death and resurrection, those Jewish men told the world about the Jewish Messiah. Now, after 2,000 years, Beth Goyim Messianic Congregation has that same calling of those Jewish men telling all people, both Jew and Gentile, about the proper ancient path, teaching the Route 66 King's Highway from Genesis through to Revelation, and how you need and can get back to the proper roots of the faith and a closer walk with God. Now, let's hear the message. to the book of Bereshit, Genesis chapter 24. Bereshit, Genesis chapter 24. This is recorded message E346. We've been here 346 Shab Arab Shabbats. This is BGMC Triennial Parashah number 21. It comes from the book of Bereshit chapter 24. Uh, there's 41 verses in this chapter. We will not be getting to all of them, okay? Uh, as we go to the first slide, if you, if you don't, first of all, first and foremost, if you're on YouTube right now, which a hundred of you were last week, hit the like button. Hit that big thumbs up button. Hit the thumbs up only once, okay? And also, if you're on YouTube, you know, send $10 and $20 and $50. If you're getting uh, information that is drawing you closer to Jehovah, Yeshua, and the Ruach HaKodesh, or in other words, Elohim, from this ministry, we don't, you know, charge anything, but we ask you to move on, the Lord to move on your heart, and to donate. Mute my microphone on, on what? It was. Now it's not. Now it is again. Okay. I've been told to mute over here. And also, if you want to be interactive with on our, on our Arab Shabbat thing, Send me an email at rabbiandrew at bethgoim.org, rabbiandrew at bethgoim.org, and then you can get on Skype or WebEx with us, and then you can be interactive on Arab Shabbat. Uh, if you miss any part of this lesson, it'll be up on our website, bgmctv.org, bgmctv.org. All right, let's get down to the lesson, okay? Um, we're in chapter 20. Four of the book of Bereshit, Genesis chapter 24. It contains 41 verses. The contents of this uh, presentation is uh, uh, of this uh, chapter is the bride of Yitzhak, secured by Abraham's servant. Okay, we're going to go into who that servant is. Uh, the characters that are in this chapter, like a movie script, is Abraham, the servant, Bituel. Levan, Sarah, and Yitzhak. Okay? The conclusion is God leads in every detail. Going on to the next slide, we have a few major sections. I think it's uh, four major sections. I don't have them all in front of me at the moment. Major section number one, okay, is chap uh, section number one is verse one and two. You might have to get closer. Uh, verse one and two, put your hand under my thigh. Okay, we're going to go under what the thigh oath is. Then section number two, verse three and four, to choose a wife for my son Yitzhak. This is all major section number one. Section number three is verse five. Suppose a woman isn't willing. Okay. Then section number four, verse six and seven, is he will send his angel ahead of you. Okay. Then section number five is verse eight and nine. The servant put his hand under the thigh of Avraham. That's hopefully what we'll get through this, this Erev Shabbat. 
What we are doing with these uh, lessons is also uh, on our uh, Bible study, our me- the City Gate Messianic Bible study on Tuesday night. Uh, we're going through all the chapter nice and slow. I think um, we're up to four parts of Parasha number two. Okay, now we go on to the next slide. Major section number two is uh, broken down from uh, ten different sections. It is uh, section number six is verse 10. The servant took 10 of his master's camels. Section number seven is verse 11, when the woman go out to draw the water. Section number eight is verse 12 through 14. Show your grace to my master, Abraham. Section number nine is verse 15 and 16, before he had finished speaking. Section number 10 is verse 17 and 18, immediately lowered her jug. Section number 11, verse 19 and 20. I will also draw water for your camels. Section number 12 is verse 21, waiting to find out. Section number 13 is verse 22 to 25, whose daughter are you? Section number 14 is verse 26 and 27, Jehovah has guided me to the house. Section number 15, verse 28, her mother's household. Section number 16, verse 29 through 31, you whom Jehovah has blessed. Okay, then we're going on to major section number three, and that is broken down into uh, seven sections, starting with section number 17, verse 32. So the man went inside. Section number 18, verse 33 to 35, Jehovah has greatly blessed my master. Section number 19, verse 36, he has given him everything he has. Section number 20, verse 37 and 38, go to my father's house, to my kinsmen. Section number 21, verse 39 to 41, send his angel with you to make your trip successful. Section number uh, 22, verse 42 to 46, before I had finished speaking to my heart. Section number 23, verse 47 to 48, whose daughter are you? And now there's two more set major sections to go through. Wait till we do the Bible study. It'll probably last like 10 weeks. <laughs> All right. Uh, section, major section number four is broken down into five sections. Section number 24 is verse 50 and 51. Levon and Bituel replied. Section number 25, verse 52 and 53, gave valuable gifts. Section number 26, verse 54 to 56, let the girls stay with us a few days. Section number 27, verse 57 to 58, will you go with this man? Section number 28, verse 59 to 60, they sent their sister Rivka away. And then finally, next slide, major section number five, is only broken into four little sections. Section number 29, verse 61, Rivka and her maids mounted the camels. Section number 30, verse 62 to 64, living in the Negev. Section number 31, verse 66, she took her veil and covered herself. It's not what you think. And section number 32 is verse 66 and 67. Yitzhak brought her into his mother's mother, his mother, Sarah's tent. Amen. So this, this chapter is quite amazing. It's jam-packed with lots of information. I'm going to get a drink here. All right, let's go on to major section number one. Okay, once again... My, my hope and prayer is that you draw closer to Elohim with this. You learn more about how he guides people. Learn more about his word. This Beth Goyim Messianic Congregation is an uh, education ministry. So if you're here for flopping on the floor, speaking in Bibble Babble, you've come to the wrong ministry. If you want to do Talmudic understanding, you've also come to the wrong ministry. We're going to break down Jehovah's Torah, his word, into many sections so that your roots can go deep. If you missed any part of it, uh, like I said, once again, we're, we're broadcasting on YouTube. We've got to get to the part where we can broadcast on Facebook Live. We're going to be trying that very shortly. And also on our website, if you want the PowerPoint on Wednesday of, uh, during this week of the recording of this message, I will put up the link so that you can download this PowerPoint. Okay, there's a lot of great information, and that way you can re-look, re-look at it later on. My prayer is also that you have a notebook, okay, 
so that you can write notes. The whole obje ob object is to learn about the Torah, how the pieces of the puzzle go together. As the world is sliding very deeply and very closely near World War III, what, the way you get through the, the, the great disasters that are possibly coming in our lifetime is by having a firm grasp of Jehovah's Word. The woman with the issue of blood grabbed hold of the tzitziot of Yeshua, and she wouldn't let go. She knew that that would heal her. So the Word of God heals us. It strengthens us. Whenever trouble comes, we learn from the past, and we see how God sends his servants, and even Gentiles are part of this, this engrafting in. Okay, so let's go to section number one, major section one, section one, verse one and two, okay? This part is entitled, put your hand, on, put your hand under my thigh, okay? Don't get sexual and stupid with this, okay? Get your minds out of the gutter. This is not a homosexual thing. This is what you're going to learn what it really is about, okay? By now, Avraham was old, advanced in years. And Jehovah had blessed Avraham in everything. Avraham said to his servant who had served him the longest, who was in charge of all he owned, put your hand under my thigh. Amen. Remember, this is 3,000 years ago. Okay, homosexuality is around because we know that from Saddam, the city of Saddam that the Lord destroyed. But it's not about that. Okay. Um, what we're going to learn, the synopsis of this, these two verses is the under my thigh vow. What does it mean? Okay, let's go to verse 1 again. By now Abraham is old, advanced in years, and Jehovah had blessed Abraham in everything. Amen? Okay, Abraham was old. Let's see how old Abraham is. <laughs> let's see how old Abraham is. Uh, now he's 140 years old. So that's a mild understatement that Avraham was old, okay? Uh, for he was 100 years old when Yitzhak was born, and Yitzhak was 40 years of age when he married Rivka, okay? Okay, so he's 140 years old, okay? Uh, which was the time Avraham must have been the age mentioned, and the references of that to prove that he's 140 years old, and I did it, was Genesis, Bereshit, chapter 21, verse 5, and then Bereshit, Genesis, chapter 25, verse 20, okay? So you can confirm the math with me, and that he is 100 years old, because Yitzchak was 40 years old when he married Rivka, right? We see that from the next chapter. He's 40 years old. Okay, this is now three years after Sarah died. It's very interesting. Okay, so we go from chapter 23, you know, her, her dying. Now, in one chapter, we've gotten a three-year period. That's why it's, like I've said in the past with, with these lessons, what I like to do is have a timeline. I like notebooks, and then, you know, sometimes if you have a study, a study place, what you should have in your home, if it, if it is possible, is to have a place of study, okay? Have a place where you have your notebooks. I, I used to, when I was a... A child liked to have things on the wall, okay? Uh, I had all these cork board along with silly posters, but um, I used to have like a timeline around me. And I, we have a timeline in one of our, our classrooms, and I think that really gives people a good reference point of what, what's going on and how fast things can move and then sometimes how slow things move. But we see details in this. Now, what is interesting is in this three-year period, we don't know what, what transpired, like from the time Sarah died, okay? You might get some insight through some other scriptures, but not a lot of details, okay? So we go from chapter 23 to chapter 24, and there's a three-year period, bang, okay? Now, uh, this is now three years after Sarah died, because remember, Sarah died at the age of 127, and she was 90 when she gave birth, okay? So she's 90 when she gave birth, Yitzhak was 37, and Yitzhak, is, we know from, the next, chap, from uh, the next chapter in chapter 25, verse 20, that Yitzhak is 40 years old when he married uh, 
Rivka, okay? So just gives you a little time frame and a little understanding um, that sometimes it's good. Now, Abraham, we don't know uh, how old was he when was Sarah, but when he left his father's house, he was 75. I think that's when Rab Eduardo's oldest daughter is going to leave to get married. She's going to be 75. <laughs> okay. Um, he's a little overprotective, okay? Just a little bit. But, you know, the second and third daughter is going to say, forget about it. You can leave when you're 10. <laughs> All right. So, um, so it, it helps to put things into perspective, okay? 40, uh, well, just a little touch of the base. Um, 40 is the number of completion in Hebrew because 40 years Moses spent in Pharaoh's house, 40 years in the desert, and 40 years in ministry. So I got another 20 to go. I don't know if I'm going to make it. I don't know if the world's going to make it. All right, let's go to the next slide and le- read verse 1 again. Now Abraham was old. Yeah, he was. Advanced in years. And Jehovah had blessed Abraham in everything. Amen? So now we see in verse 1 that he blessed him in everything. Not just um, his, his spirit... Okay, because we see finally Abraham has is, is really made peace with the Lord. Okay, you know, after Sarah died, um, you know, we, we went through the whole thing in the last parasha, in parasha number 20, 20 we went through that last week with um, him, you know, going through the whole cave thing and not really trusting. But now in chapter 24 of Bereshit, we see that Jehovah has blessed him in everything. So there seems to be, a ch- in that three-year period, there seems to be a change. Now, why do we, why do we talk about that? What, what, do we, what, do we, what do we care about it today? Okay? See, a lot of times people fight with Jehovah. They fight following the commandments. They fight um, in their own spirit, trusting. I think that's one of the biggest factors. Okay? Even in the beginning of the, this ministry, you know, Sometimes, you know, you, you work on your own strength, and that's when it's a disaster. Um, even though this is Jehovah's ministry, I want my Father in heaven to look the best. I don't want to d- disrespect his name at all. So I would try my hardest, and sometimes on my own strength. And then finally, you know, one day, a couple of years into the ministry, I just said, you know what, Jehovah, this is, this is your ministry. You're the one who called me to do this. And I'd already been in doing, you know, ministry at another place, another sort of messianic congregation. And when I finally learned to just trust in Jehovah, then my shalom came, you know, like even tonight, you know, the, the work that the ministry is doing for the world and what I have on my own spirit, seeing all these things go around, you know, I tirelessly work to, you know, especially on Fridays, to prepare for the blessings that I want to bring to you, the people that are watching, the people that are here in the congregation. I don't do this for my own uh, puffiness, my own ego, because if I wanted to do it for my ego, I would definitely not be in ministry. I'd go back into making movies because that's what I'm really good at. Okay, that one, you know, uh, that's why I won awards for it. But I won awards when that old lady that came to the congregation a few weeks ago. Here was she was giving her life to Yeshua at her age. I think she's in her 80s, or late 70s, early 80s. That is my reward, okay? So here, what we look at in verse 1, look, let's read verse 1 again. By now, Abraham was old, advanced years, and Jehovah blessed Abraham in everything, amen? So we're going to look at two Hebrew words. When I go to the Hebrew words, I'm not going to always keep saying it. I'm going to say it once at the beginning of the lesson. I'm going to the root word. The reason I go to the root word, because there are some nuances to Hebrew. The root word gives you the main meaning of what the word itself means. Some of the prefixes and suffixes give you um, male or female ownership. Some of the vowel points will give you some other information about it. But the basic concept that most people can get it into. And I highly recommend everybody learning God's perfect language of Hebrew. Okay? I, I, they have some great 
um, sabras in the land that teach in many different languages. Okay, um, I know there's a Spanish to Hebrew one. Um, I know there's an English to Hebrew one. And it's well worth the money spent if you're going to put the time into it. The program's like 10 minutes a day Hebrew. You're going to be learning um, modern Hebrew. If you really want to learn biblical Hebrew, you need to learn from a sabra. And there are classes that do biblical Hebrew. Okay, so when I give the words, it is going to be the root word. We're going to give the definitions. I'm going to give you the Strong's uh, number or actually the uh, Briggs driver number. Okay, that's what I like the best. I like the way it's laid out. And my methodology, like I said before, I think I said it last week, is I go from the complete Jewish Bible, which is basically the, is the JPS, the Jewish Publication Society Bible. I confirm that word with the NASB, which went from the Hebrew uh, to English. And then I confirm that with a Hebrew Torah scroll. Okay, just to confirm that the word is the word. Because sometimes there are variances in some of the translation. Okay, so let's read verse 1 again. I just want to get that because we're in education ministry. Okay, it's not, uh, it's not a newsflash. But this is the type of ministry that this one is. And my job is to teach because Isaiah 42 said, My job as a Hebrew man, a Messianic, a, a Torah observant Hebrew man, Messianic, is to bring the keys to the dungeon so that I can bring the Torah. It says in Isaiah 42, I think it's verse 4, where it says that the, the coastlands wait for Torah. And we're going to be talking about that tomorrow in tomorrow's lesson. Okay, verse 1 again. Okay, now we're going to get deep into the lesson. And now Abraham is old, advanced in years. And Jehovah had blessed Abraham and everything. Amen? So we're going to first look at the word blessing. Because as I said, you know, once you really get shalom, and this is why we look at the scriptures, because we see that Abraham made a bunch of mistakes. Okay? But God loved him because they were mistakes that cost time. And we want to learn from that because we don't want to cost time. Because you, you steal from yourself. Jehovah wants to bless us. He desires to bless us. He desires for us to draw near. But sometimes it took Abraham 140 years to finally get it. Okay? So here, what is the word blessed? It is H1288. It is the Hebrew word, root word, Barak. Okay? Bet, Resh, um, um, Kuf. Uh, no. Ka yeah, Kof. No, Kof. Okay? Besh, Besh, it's a Kof, so feet. Okay? Now, what does it mean? Number one, to bless, kneel. Number two, to be blessed, be adored. Number three, to praise, salute, curse. Okay? So, when you look at the definitions, remember, Hebrew is a very small language. It has... Um, you have to read the word, the Hebrew. What you would do is read the, read the Hebrew in context and then discern which definition because remember, as I've said in the past, the chapters and verses were put in by the librarian, the 70 rabbis, when they made the Septuagint in the year 700 or 500, whichever year you want to, but it was at least 500 years before Messiah came to earth. Okay? So you would read a panel. Okay? So... Here, Jehovah had blessed Abraham and everything. So that would be more to the definition number two. To be blessed, be adored. So here, Jehovah is what he's saying in the Ivrit is he adored Abraham. And you see that in these teachings that we've done for the last um, 21 weeks. Okay, You really do see a, an incredible relationship of man with his creator, okay? You see Abraham being blessed. You see Abraham have joy. You see conversations between Jehovah Elohim with, um, with Abraham. You see Elohim coming to Abraham's house, okay? That was a beautiful parasha. Remember, we were talking about that, how he, he stood there and he, he invited uh, Elohim and Jehovah Elohim into his house, and they, they had a conversation. He sat down with him. Imagine being able to have that type of conversation with him. Okay, so here, 
in verse 1, but Abraham was old, advanced in years. Jehovah had blessed Abraham and everything. Okay? So here he blessed him. He adored him, adorned him with everything. And that is available to us because it is not exclusive to Abraham. And we see through Abraham's life that he was imperfect. So we don't have to be perfect. We have to strive for perfection, strive for the highest level. And if you fall short, Jehovah understands because he's a parent. That's what we call Jehovah our father. Avinu, our father. Okay? Avinu is our father. A father knows when his child is trying. And a father knows when a child has made a mistake. And a father, when he sees his child doing that, when he's made a mistake but it wasn't... Um, with, you know, malice that the child did it. The, a, a parent loves their child no matter what, okay? Now, they might not like the child because the way that it turned out, but here Abraham made some mistakes, and, but here we see with the word blessed. Now, in this three-year period, something has drastically changed, okay? So here he blessed him, he adorned him, he adored him, and that is for the rest of us, okay? Now, here, why do I say that? Because let's read verse 1 again. By, by now, Abraham was old, advanced in years, and, uh, and Jehovah blessed Abraham in everything. Amen? So now, let's look at the next, it probably is on the next slide, it is word everything. It is H3605. 3605, it is the Hebrew word kol. Okay, the BDB definition is, number one, all, the whole, any, each, every, everything. That's definition number one. Okay, definition number two is totally and everything. Amen. So now, so here, the relationship is finally, Abraham is finally rested in Jehovah. Now, I highly recommend um, not taking that much time to do that, <laughs> okay? Um, because who knows if you're going to live, how, you know, who knows if you're going to live another day. But what, like I said, what we do see in this passage and why I'm taking so long in verse 1 is a lot of times when we get older in the Lord, and I've seen this because I've been doing ministry for tw almost tw 20 years now, and I see great blessings when people just yield to Jehovah yield to his word, and don't try to fight his word. But every time somebody tries to fight his word, I see such upheaval, okay? And I also see it when people who are in the Lord, followers of the way, when they get complacent, okay? So Abraham was finally, you know, resting in the Lord, trusting in the Lord. So here Jehovah says, he blessed him, Barak, in coal, everything, okay? Number one again, all, the whole, any, each, every, anything, okay? Number two, totality, uh, totally, sorry, not totality, to totally in everything. So in every aspect of Abraham's life, he finally got it, okay? Now, it took all this time, and I once again suggest not doing that, but to trust, if Torah says it, do it. Now, God also, Jehovah Elohim, does not change. So I've said this for the last couple of weeks because there's a lot of garbage on the Internet. There's a lot of garbage teachers. So if you want to know about me, you go to our statement of faith. It's a very long statement of faith. You see where I went to school. You see my credentials. Okay? When you're listening to somebody, research who you're listening to because if I give you a whole glass of your favorite drink and I got bug juice, okay, how many drops of arsenic do I need in it to kill you? Okay, what happens to a lot of Messianic believers is they want to be Jewish so much they slingshot. Okay, they, they want to be Jewish, so they start doing Talmud. They start doing tradition. And God does not want that. Yeshua said the tradition of the elders. He chastised them for doing that. Okay, when I'm talking to you, I'm trying to teach from straight from the Word of God, okay? Now let's go on to the next slide. Let's go to verse 1 and 2 again. We're going to be focusing on verse 2, but we're going to read 1 and 2. 
Now, Abraham was old, advanced in years, and Jehovah had blessed Abraham and everything. Abraham said to his servant, who had, put, who had served him the longest, who was in charge of all he owned, put your hand under my thigh. Amen? So a lot of people say, you can't tell who that is. You can if you read the daggone Bible. Once God says something, it doesn't change unless... So if God said, keep the Sabbath here, keep Passover here, keep Shavuot 50 days after the Hashabbat of Pesach. See, a lot of people are doing the Shavuot tomorrow. They're following the rabbis. If you would read the Bible and follow in God's understanding, there's a difference between Shabbat and HaShabbat. HaShabbat is the weekly Shabbat, the Shabbat. The holy days are Shabbat. A holy, a holy day is a Shabbat, but there's a weekly HaShabbat. Okay, it says generally in your translation, the Shabbat. Okay, so I was reading the commentaries and things like that in the Talmud. And I'm like, well, we don't know who the older servant is. It, you do if you just went back to Bereshit 15, verse 2. Genesis 15, verse 2, it tells you who it is. So the servant who served him the, the longest is Eliezer. Okay, Eliezer, his servant, it is generally thought, and who may well be, be called the old servant, the oldest servant, since he lived with him 50 years and upwards, okay? And one, one may trace his near 60 years in Abraham's family to a highly probable he lived much longer. And all you have to do is go back to Bereshit 15, verse 2, okay? See, if you take the Bible as a whole and you, you slowly read it and you take your notes and you build your building blocks so you don't take things out. Like, it doesn't say Eliezer died, Okay? The, why does it just say the servant who served him the longest? Because you already know who it is. It's implied. Okay? See, a lot of people don't get, you know, we're talking to somebody about, you know, the garden, the Gan Eden. You know, Hava gave the fruit to Adam. Well, he was sitting right next to her. Why? It's implied. Just like here. Okay? Why does it say servant? Because you already know who the servant is. Okay, because you read it, you know, you read blocks of scripture. Okay, a Torah scroll is a panel. Okay, it would be only a couple of panels before that. Okay, not many panels before that. Okay, so you know who the oldest servant is. Now look at verse 2. Abraham said to his servant who had served him the longest, who was in charge of all he owned, put your hand under my thigh. Now this is, this, now this is also another understanding. Is when you get, you get a further understanding of how the servant stays. So the servant might have been a servant in, the, in slavery. Slavery is only up to seven, six full years. Six full years, and on the seventh, you get released. But if the servant doesn't want to leave, he gets his ear pierced to the door and says, I love my master, I don't want to leave. Okay? So not that we see Eliezer get his, getting his ear pierced to the door. That would be written later because it would be said later. Okay? But you get an understanding. But you also get an understanding of time. This is why we looked at Abraham. How old was he? Okay. So he was 75 when he left his father's house. And then we, you, know, you go through the chapters and we know, we know now he's 140 years old. Okay. Now you also know that Eliezer, who had served him the longest. We don't, you know, we don't, have, to, we don't have to write the name. Why? Because it's implied. Because if you, if you were, took the time to read your Bible, and you build your blocks. You don't take, you know, here in America, up here in the northern part, uh, northeast, we build homes, okay? Now, when you build a home, here, you put a basement in. You dig a big hole, and you build a basement. You level out the hole, you put the cinder blocks in, you build the concrete and stuff like that, okay? So it's the same with the scriptures. Once you build your house, you don't take the basement out of the house. Well, I don't want my basement anymore. We're going to fill it in with concrete. No, you don't do that. Okay? So here it's something called implied because Jehovah already knows that you're supposed to be reading it and you've already built your building blocks with it. Okay? Now we go on to the next slide, verse 2 again, please. Abraham was said to his servant who had served him the longest, who was in charge of all he owned, put your hand under my thigh. Okay? Now, here, we know from earlier on in the scripture 
that Eliezer from Damascus or Damasek was in charge of all the own because Abraham was worried about him being his heir. So here, the, the servant had served him the longest was in charge of everything Abraham old, owned, okay, because he was old, okay? I got two think, sentences crossed in my mind. Creak! Okay? Not enough coffee today, okay? And here, Eliezer is the steward of his house. Now, you have to understand stewardship, okay? He's in charge, but if the master, the master comes back, if it, the master has gone away on a journey, now, the reason you need to understand this is like if you watch the Lord of the Rings uh, movie series, which I highly recommend, it's phenomenal. It is a pattern after the, the scriptures, okay? Now, here there was a steward taking over something. Now, Eliezer was a steward because he was younger than Abraham, and he was in charge of everything he owned. Even though Abraham was there, Abraham is 140 years old, he might, you know, he might be moving just a little bit slower than normal, like I feel sometimes, okay? So he, here, he's watching over all of Abraham's stuff, and it's what, you know, an, um, a servant does, a good servant helps to hold up the master's hands, okay? Now here, the next part of the sentence that I wrote, uh, the, 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 the steward ruled over all that Abraham had. Now here... The master is in charge, but he's allowing his steward. Now, is the steward a Jew or a Gentile? This is also something looked at. He's a Gentile. The Gentiles, now, this goes to Revelation, you know, when the, the time of the Gentiles is complete. Okay? So here, it's very important to understand stewardship. Now, if you're a good steward, you'll be blessed by the master, but if you're a bad steward, you know, remember Yeshua gets a parable? You know, the master goes on about, and he, he said, what did you do with my denarius? Oh, well, well I, I, I did this and this. I mean, you gave me, gave me five, I, I got ten now. Mina, it was a mina, sorry, so I said denarius. Okay, so the, 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 why we need to look at this is because once you understand the stewardship of Eliezer, you now understand what Yeshua the Jew is telling the other people. Can he put you in charge and you're not going to ruin things? Well, I put it under a rock because you were a hard man. And what did Yeshua say? You know, throw him, throw him outside with the people in that whale and gnash your teeth. So here, Eliezer is ruling over all that he had, uh, had the care and management of his house. You know, these are understandings that we need to understand because Yeshua has put us in charge. Therefore, go make Talmudin of all the goyim. He's put us in charge. What do you do with it? Okay? Do you safeguard the Torah or do you become like the goyim church or sadly the messianic body that you know, is not a good steward of the Torah that God gave us? Okay? Now, the steward and the affairs are underneath him. He's in charge, so he's running his house. Uh, this agrees with the character of Eliezer in Genesis 15, verse 2. Okay? Now let's go on to... We've gotten to two verses and it only took me 25 minutes. We're not, we're not even done yet. Next, next slide, verse number 2 again. <laughs> Don't rush. Don't rush. If you miss anything, wait till it renders on YouTube and go watch it again. If you could take my voice. If you can't take my voice, bring it in and change it to, you know, some other deep voice or something like that. Okay, number two. Abraham said to his servant, who served him the longest, who was in charge of all he owned, put your hand on the might die. Okay, now this is not something sexual, but it does have something to do with the thigh. Okay, we're going to learn what the thigh is. Now put your under... under Hand under my thigh. The first part to understand the thigh in Hebrew. We have to understand what the thigh in Hebrew is. Okay? Because Yod, okay, Yod in Hebrew is from the middle finger to the elbow. Okay? So here, you know, the, the, the Jews are following Talmud. 
They're putting the tefillin, it's supposed to be on your hand. Okay? The tefillin is supposed to be on your hand. Your hand is not your bicep. Okay? That is your arm. The hand goes from your finger to the elbow. Okay? So now we're looking at verse 2 again. Now that we have that little bit understanding, Abraham said to his servant who had served him the longest, who was in charge of all he owned, put your hand under my thigh. Now, what is thigh? Okay? Thigh in Hebrew is H3409. 3409 is the Hebrew word yorek. Okay? Number one. Thigh, side, loin, base. Number two, this is a very important definition. Number two, outside of thigh where the sword was worn. Number three, loins as in the seat of procreative power. So let's look at those things. Okay, now the thigh is from your hip to your knee. Okay, because how would you wear a sword? Okay, how would you wear a sword? How would you smack it on your side? Okay, you would tie it to your hip as if it were a belt. Okay, and the sword would go here if you're left-handed or right-handed. Well, it all depends where you, the handle would be up here. And the sword generally is, um, it can be all the way down to your foot, but generally went about the knee. Okay, so a sword so once you understand that, it's not just the thigh. Why would you have somebody put your hand under your thigh? Number one, thigh, yarek. Now it's the, it's the root word. Thigh, side, loin, base. The loin is where the man's penis and his scrotum is. The loins. It's called the loins. A little bit more uppity in type of talking. You know, he didn't say penis. He didn't say scrotum. He said the loins. Because it was just more proper to say loins. But everybody knew what it was to mean. Right? I'm Nigel Thornberry. Okay? So here, once you understand that, that the Hebrew doesn't, you know, the loins, it's a very different, because it's an English word. It's an English translation. Okay? So here, put your hand under my thigh, between the knee and and the hip, and those parts that are in between. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. Verse 1 and 2 again. By now Abraham was old, advanced in years, and Jehovah had blessed Abraham and everything. Abraham said to the servant, who had served him the longest, who was in charge of all he owned, put your hand under my thigh. Amen? Now, now, putting your hand under his thigh, meaning the one whose thigh was the one who the covenant was being made to. So the servant is putting his hand under the master's thigh. Okay? One, also remember, he's not in a, a four-post bed. He's not five feet off the ground. The servant... Beds back then were pretty low to the ground, maybe slightly off the ground. Uh, Abraham was rich, so maybe he had a little bit of bed. wasn't just a mat on the dirt floor. Okay, so here the servant would have to bow. He would have to bow to his master to place his hand under his thigh. Okay. Now, when you're doing that, when you're placing your hand for this thigh bow, you are May, serving the, your master by doing it. You're saying, I'm your servant. Because whoever is putting the hand under is the servant, and the master is the one whose thigh was the covenant was being made to. Now that we know that what the thigh means from the hip to the knee, what else is located on a man between hip and knee? The place of the seed. Okay? What is located in the anatomy of a man between the hip and the knee is his buttocks, but then the place of the loins, the seed, the penis, and the scrotum. Okay, now going on to the next slide, let's read one number two again. 
Abraham said to the servant who had served him the longest, who was in charge of all he owned, put your hand under my thigh. Amen? In swearing, the servant put his hand under Abraham's thigh. This kachim, which is only mentioned here and in Bereshit, Genesis 47, verse 29, is so-called the bodily oath. It was no doubt connected with the significance of the seed as the part from which the posterity lineage issued. So let's break that down, what I wrote down. Once again, you can read it on the screen as I'm reading what I wrote. Now I'm going to break it down and explain it to you. The servant putting his hand under the thigh, we only have two references of this. This is the law first reference, and then in Bereshit 47, verse 29. Okay, so by putting the hand under the thigh, you're saying that if you break this vow, whatever the vow is going to be, whatever the details of the vow are going to be, if you break the vow, that means your seed your, to the third and fourth generation of children that you may have and grandchildren that you may have and great-grandchildren that you may have are going to suffer because of your vow. Okay? This is what you're doing. Now, we're going to go through the terms that Abraham and Eliezer go through. Because Eliezer, the servant, is going to ask twice. So he confirms what is being said to him. Because this is a very important vow. A vow that can't not, cannot be broken unless you're released by, your, by the master. Okay? But you have to understand the terms of the agreement. Okay? This is what people understand when they make a vow to the Lord. Okay? They don't understand when they accept Yeshua as Messiah. You're saying when you, when you receive salvation, when you accept Yeshua into your heart, okay, you're saying to Satan, I'm leaving you. You're making a vow to the Lord. But then a lot of people don't change their lives. And then the Lord says, okay, you're really not my servant. I'm going to give you back. I'm going to let Satan take you because you did not keep your vow. Okay? Now, the, Jehovah gives you time to do these things. Okay? Now, for the oath was, for if the oath was broken, it would therefore be considered a lie. Okay? So if you break the oath, this is why I'm taking so much time to do this. Now, we can still do these things because Yeshua said in Matthew 5, 18, what? Not one jot or tittle will be missing from the law until heaven and earth pass away. But people open their mouths and they don't really mean what they say. Okay, this ministry teaches that the law is still there. We're 100% legalistic, and we love it because my God, if I'm counting on my God, Avinu, to keep his promises, shouldn't I keep my promises if I'm his child, if I'm his emissary, if I'm his ambassador to the world, as we all are, those of us who accepted Yeshua as Messiah, we're the ambassadors to the world to bring righteousness to the chaos. Okay, so here, if the vow is broken, then it would be considered a lie. And li liars, it should be liars are placed, lies are placed on the liar's children. Okay? Lies are placed on the liar's children. What does that mean? Second commandment, everybody. Second commandment. Because Torah lives inside of us. Okay? So Eliezer knew that because we're all created by the same God. Okay? He just made a covenant with Abraham, which everybody can be part of, and we're going to see that later on, that Eleazar really has accepted the God of Abraham. Let's go on to the next slide. Two verses. only took us 40 minutes. Awesome. Let's go on to section number two. I'm going to take a drink, and then section number two, while you go to verse three and four. Section 2, verse 3 and 4, to choose a wife for my son Yitzhak. Because I want you to swear by Jehovah, Elohim of heaven and Elohim of earth, that you will not choose a wife for my son from among the women of the Kenai, among whom I am living, but that you will go to my homeland, to my kinsmen, to choose a wife for my son Yitzhak. Amen? Now let's read the synopsis of what I wrote, and then we'll talk about that for a moment. The terms and the reasons for such of a high oath, choosing a wife from among Abraham's kindred. Okay? So here, 
Avraham is not going to be going on this journey. It's going to take him, the, the servant Eliezer, quite a long time. Uh, where he could have disappeared, he could have been robbed, and a whole bunch of things. And remember, Abraham is 140 years old. Okay? So here are the reasons for such a high oath. If we read the chapter already, what you're supposed to do. Uh, he's going to take 10 camels and a lot of stuff and a lot of money with him. He could have disappeared. Okay? Now, Abraham is, is trusting his servant to choose a wife from among the from Abraham's kindred. We're going to go what? We're going to find out why he wanted him to go back instead of the women of the Kenai. Okay? Now let's go to the next slide. We're going to read verse 3 again. Because I want you to swear by Jehovah, Elohim of heaven and Elohim of earth, that you will not choose a wife for my son from among the women of the Kenai, among whom I am living. Amen? So the first thing we're going to look at in verse 3, we're going to probably take this to the end, these two verses. Um, verse 3 is he wants him to swear an oath. Now, what is swear? We're not supposed to swear. Yes, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Okay? So, what is the word swearing? Okay? H7650, Shabbat. Shabbat, like Shabbat. Shabbat, number one definition. To swear, adjure. Number two, sworn, participle. Number three, to swear, take an oath. Amen? Okay, so this is what Shabbat, the root word means, is I'm going to take an oath. Okay, and we can all take oaths. Okay? Because let your yes be yes. If somebody says, will you do this, and blah, 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 and you say yes, that's an oath. Okay? Before you say yes, understand the terms for what you're doing. Most people do not do that. Okay? So here... Abraham, let's read verse 3, now that we know what the word swear means, because I want, to, want you to swear by Jehovah, Elohim of heaven, and Elohim of the earth, that you will not choose a wife from, for my son from among the women of the Kenai, among whom I am living. Amen? So he says, I want you to take an oath. Okay? So an oath is going to be something that we speak. Okay? So we're going to see this great interaction between Abraham and and his servant, Eliezer. Okay? Now, here, let's read verse 3 again before we go on to the next Hebrew word that we're going to learn. Because I want you to swear by Jehovah, Elohim of heaven and Elohim of earth, that you will not choose a wife for my son from among the women that can I, among whom I am living. Amen? So here, he's going to take an oath by Jehovah. Jehovah is H3068. yud Hey vav Hey. Jehovah, not, Ye not Yahweh, not Yahuwah, Yahwawah. There's no W in Hebrew, okay? Don't ever, anybody who says Yehoshua, Yahawa, okay? There's a lot of idiots out there that don't know how to read Hebrew. Now, the reason I'm saying this, because I asked a Sabra, a colonel in the IDF, I'll say this one more time, because Hebrew's not my first language, and ling languages are not my greatest strain. Okay? So I was in Israel, and I'm with, a, I'm with some people from the IDF, and the colonel, who I greatly respect, who was born in Israel, his first language is Hebrew. So I show him, this, I show him a verse in the, he in the Hebrew, and I said, I don't care. I don't want to know. I'm not getting into theology here. I just want to know what this word says and what it means. Are there any criteria that I need to understand? Like in English... We have I before E except after C, which sometimes I don't get, okay? And I still misspell, okay? So, and then uh, we have, if you have an E at the end of a word and a vowel in the middle of the word, it makes a vowel a long sound, okay? So I said this is a kernel. I'm like, in Hebrew, are there any rules? You know, does the vav make a W sound? I'm like, I don't care what it means. Just tell me the rule. And he's like, where did you hear this? It just makes a vav, a v, an u. No w. I had never learned that in here in Israel. Okay? So anybody who's saying, you know, this is a colonel in the IDF, okay? He's fought in a lot of wars. Didn't take a bullet to the head or anything. 
okay? Served under Ariel Sharon, was his commander-in-chief, so that's a pretty good guy, okay? Worked with Netanyahu, okay? So I'm going to believe him. So anybody who says Yehovah, Yahweh, Yeshua, Yahweh, doesn't know anything about the Hebrew language. So they're suspect to any information that they're giving you thereafter, okay? Unless they can say, well, if the Vav follows this, okay, then confirm that, right? Did, did you, you're, you're, you're taking Hebrew classes. Did you, your, your Sabra teacher say the Vav ever makes a W sound? Okay, so Rabad is confirming this from his Sabra Hebrew class that he's taking online. The, the Vav never makes a W sound. Okay, so now that we know that, let's get back to today's lesson. That was your Hebrew lesson for today. This is why we try this, because there's so much in the language that we can understand, and there's a lot of crappy teachers out there. Okay, so if, if you want to confirm that, then do. Confirm everything I'm saying. Yehovah is H. 3068 Yehovah. Yod Hey Vav Hey. Yehovah means the existing one. Number one, the proper name of the one true God. Okay? So here Abraham is asking Eliezer to make a vow, a word that Yehovah is going to hear. And when any two of you are together, there the Lord is in our midst. Okay? So here he's going, it's not going to be something you're going to nod your head. Well, I really didn't nod my head. It's going to be something that is spoken. And then also an action that is also required. So it is spirit and in truth, okay? Speaking and action, okay? Going on to the next slide, verse 3 again. So I want you to swear by Jehovah, Elohim of heaven and Elohim of earth, that you will not choose a wife for my son from among the women of the Kenai among whom I am living, amen? Okay, the maker and possessor of heaven and earth, to whom Abraham used to swear he did, and by whom only men swear. Okay? Great. Okay? So here, the reference of that is Genesis 14, verse 22. Okay? Now, here, sometimes the, the Talmud is, is good because it gives you... The Talmud is bad for theology. It is good for how things are set, okay? The Targum of Jonathan is one of the Talmud that I read. I will make thee swear by the name of the word of the Lord, your Lord of God, okay? Now, here in the Targum, it gives you some more of the insight into the Hebrew language, okay? It's not good for theology, like I said. Theology is garbage when it comes to this, but for language, it is great, okay? Okay? So here the Targum says, I will make thee swear by the name of your, the word of Jehovah, uh, the word of the Lord our God, which strengthens the sense given to the right before it's observed. So when you, you swear by the name of, it gives that much more power to what you're going to be doing and that much more of a level of that what you're going to be doing. Okay? Verse number three again. Next slide. Because I want you to swear by Jehovah, the Elohim of heaven and the Elohim of earth, that you will not choose a wife for my son from among the women of the Kenai, among whom you are living. Amen? Uh, now, now, now let's see what this means. Why did Abraham, we're going to get into why Abraham didn't want a, a woman from the Kenai. Okay? Now, here, that you will not choose a wife from the Kenai. Okay? Now here, now let's look at the word choose. Okay? In some translations, it is the word take. Okay? It is the Hebrew word H3947, 3947. It is the Hebrew word lakak. It means, number one, to take, get, fetch, lay hold of, seize, receive, acquire, buy, bring, marry, take a wife, snatch, take away. Okay, so lakak is a, a very big word. Okay, once again, it is only the root, the root word. Okay? So here, he's saying, I want you to get a woman, lay hold of. I don't think he's going to seize a woman. That would not be righteous, okay? We're not going to war, okay? Let's look at definition number two before we get, 
Try to discern which it is. Number two, to take from, take out of, take, carry away, take away. Number three, to take to or for a person, procure, get, take possession of, select, choose, take in marriage, receive, accept. Amen? So here what we want to really discern is definition number three. He, if you read it in context of the sentence and of the, the chapter, number three is it. So we're going to look at number three and we're going to break it down a little bit. To take to or fetch a person or for a person. Procure, get, take possession of, select, choose, take in marriage, receive, and accept. Okay, so let's take a look at definition number three, what Abraham is asking Eliezer, his servant, to do. Okay, so here he's saying to take, take to or for a person. Procure, like I procure a piece of land. I go and buy it and I procure it for my family. Okay, to take possession of. People are saying, well, we don't take possession of people. Yes, you do. Actually, biblically, you do. Okay, this is not a Western thought process, but it is a biblical thought process. Everybody, everything that is under the man's roof and his barn or on his land is the biblical man's property. Okay? Now, this is hard for especially Latin women to understand and for Western women to understand because we, they don't live amongst many biblical men, Torah observant, messianic men who, follow, who fear God. Okay? So here, Abraham is saying, go get a possession for Yitzhak, okay? A wife is a property of her husband biblically. My wife of 30 years is my property biblically, okay? She is God's daughter, and I'm to treat his property that he's lent to me for my life and my wife as my property. And there are rules that go along with that. But here, Abraham is saying to Eliezer, go get a piece of property for my son. Okay? Then here, take in marriage. So, lakach means to take in marriage. Lakach, okay, means to take in marriage. Okay? Take in marriage. Okay? To receive. Okay? She's going to receive this gift in marriage. Okay? So, here he's, he's getting really deep in what he wants him to do. And this is why... We have the thigh vow. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Verse 3 and 4. Because I want, to want you to swear by Jehovah, God of heaven, Elohim of heaven, Elohim of earth, that you will not choose a wife from my son, from among the women of the Kenai, among whom I am living, but that you will go to my homeland, to my kinsmen, to choose a wife for my son. Amen? Okay. The statement speaks against homosexuality. What do you mean? Okay. How does verse 3 and 4 speak against homosexuality? Well, it's implied. Once again, it's implied. It's backwards thought process. This is what a lot of people don't understand about the head covering of the woman. And the midbar numbers 518. The backwards understanding. A lot of Gentiles and a lot of Jews don't even get this because they don't take the time to read the scriptures. Okay? So how is verse 3 speaking against homosexuality? Because I want you to swear by Jehovah, the Elohim of heaven and Elohim of earth, that you will not choose a wife for my son from among the women of the Kenai, among whom I'm living. Amen? So how does it speak against homosexuality? Because he says, I want you to get a wife for my son. He doesn't say, go get a boy toy for my son. At the YMCA, he doesn't want you to get, go get one of the village people. He wants you to get a girl. Okay? Now, let's see. Now, here the key word in verse 3 that we're looking at for this particular part is the word that's implied. Is, it's implied that it's heterosexuality. Okay? Heterosexual. Okay, not homosexual. Okay, the word that we're looking at is wife. This is H802. It is Isha or Nashim. Definition number one. 
Woman, wife, female. Number two, woman, opposite of man. So here in verse three, the implied understanding is that it's heterosexual. Okay, it is not homosexual. This is why they're going to try to ban the Bible worldwide very soon. So make sure you get a Bible. Hide some Bibles. Memorize Bibles. Okay, this is what, why? Because here we're speaking about being heterosexual. Okay, because of the word wife. Let's once again go over that. H802. It is Isha, Aleph Shin He. Or Nashim, Nun, Shin, Yod, Mem, Sofit. Nashim. That is the root word. Okay? It means woman, wife, female. Number two, woman, opposite of man. So here it's heterosexual. Okay? So if we're saying go get a wife, why didn't you say go get a boy for, uh, for Yitzhak? He's a very nice boy. No, we're not doing that because that's an abomination to the Lord. And if you're in homosexuality... You can get out of it. You just have to ask God for help. And you have to choose life over death. Now, here, let's do verse 3 because I want to get to that before we close in a little bit. Verse 3 and 4. Because I want you to swear an oath by Jehovah the Elohim of heaven and earth, heaven and, and the Elohim of earth, that you will not choose a wife for my son from among the women of the Kenai, among whom I am living, but that you will go to my homeland to my kinsman to choose a wife for my son Yitzhak. Amen? Now, here, in the next slide, why did he say not from the Canaanite women? Okay? Now, first, there must be a heavenly reason why uh, Jehovah chose to remove these people from the particular land. The first reason is that. Okay? Now, Jehovah has given this land over to Abraham and his descendants. Now, there must be a heavenly reason why he's, why he's taking this land away from this group of people and giving it to another group of people. Just like when we went to the promised land, he removed the people little by little from our land that he was giving us. Now, here, the Canaanai, the Canaanites, are mentioned over 150 times in the Bible. Now, here, they are... They were a wicked, idolatrous people descended from Noah's grandson, Canaan, who was a son of Ham. And that is in reference, Bereshit, Genesis 9, verse 18. So these Canaanite are those descendants of a cursed people from Ham. Because Ham, that's why we don't eat it, because it's not kosher. Okay, but um bum Canaan was cursed because of his and his father's sin against Noah, and that is Genesis 9, Bereshit 9, verse 20 and 25. Now, also, Yeshua, in Matthew, Metiyahu 15, verse 20 to 26, Yeshua calls the Canaanite woman a dog. Woof! 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 That wasn't very nice, Yeshua. Well, the shoe fits, wear it, okay? So here, if you search the scriptures, you then get the understanding of why Abraham didn't want a Canaanite daughter-in-law, okay? Because they're a cursed people, okay? So remember, Abraham is a prophet of Jehovah. He now has peace with Jehovah. So not that we can prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt, but once we search the scriptures... Oh, we will go back to Bereshit 9 and we go, well, who are the Canaanite people? Okay, we go back to Bereshit 9 verse 18 and we go, oh, okay, and this is why, uh, and they're idolatrous people. And then you search 150 times, you go, well, that was a good thing that he wouldn't want that for his son. Okay, we don't need Talmud for that. Okay, you need a concordance and a heart for wanting to learn the word of God. Okay, next slide. Verse 3 again. Because I want you to swear by Jehovah the Elohim of heaven and the Elohim of earth that you will not choose a wife from my son from among the women I among whom I am living, 
but that you will go to my homeland, to my kinsmen, to choose a wife for my son, Yitzhak. Okay? Sorta, sorta, I just went back to my old yeshiva. Because <laughs> they sing it. They, what they do, if you've ever been in the, uh, an Orthodox or Reform synagogue, they have a cantor. And they sing the Torah portion. Okay, so that's what I did. Sorry about that. Okay. Now, he says he wants you to choose a wife from my kinsmen. For if Sarah, who was, was there, is good enough for Yitzhak's, to be Yitzhak's mother, so will a wife from there also be. Okay? So Abraham's like, well, Sarah was a pretty good one. You know, she did what I asked her to do. You know, and I told her, say you're my sister. She did. Not once, but twice. Okay? So, you know, he's using a little bit worldly wisdom, or is he maybe being moved by the Spirit? We cannot prove that beyond a shadow of a doubt, but we know that he doesn't want the Canaanite women because we just went over it, okay? So here, Sarah was a good wife for Abraham. She was the mother of Yitzhak. So if she's good enough to be the mother of Yitzhak, the child of the promise, go back to my family and get me another one of those, okay? Now here, verse uh, 3 again, because I want to swear by Jehovah, the Elohim of uh, heaven and the Elohim of earth, I will not choose a wife for my son from the women of the Kenai among whom I am living. Uh, amen. Now let's take a look at the word live. Live is H3427. 3427. It is the uh, Hebrew word, root word yeshab. Yesham. Yod uh, shin bet. Uh, means to dwell. Remain, sit, abide. Number two, to be set. Number three, to remain, stay. Number four, to dwell, have one's abode. Number five, to be inhabited. Number six, place. Amen? So here he's having his place where he's living. Okay, he's remaining there. He's not leaving. He's, uh, so here he's living amongst these people, but he understands who they are. Okay? So God said, you know, he's finally had some peace with the, with the Jehovah, as we saw in verse 1. All right, let's go on to the next slide. Pick up the pace just a little bit so we can get through verse 4. We'll go for another 5 to 10 minutes just till we finish verse 4. Let's see how many slides we've got. One, two, three. Okay, we've got three more slides to go, everybody. So we'll go to five, five or 10 more minutes. Verse 3 and 4. Because I want you to swear by Jehovah the Elohim of heaven and the Elohim of earth that you will not choose a wife from my, from my son, from among the women that can I, among whom I am living but that you will go to my homeland, to my kinsmen, to choose a wife for my son Yitzhak. Now we're focusing on verse number four. Where's Tristan? Okay, go to my homeland. The land was given to the people are not like the, the land that was given, but the people are not like-minded. Okay? Okay, so here he wants you to go to my homeland, to my kindred, to the family of Nakor, his brother. Okay? So now he's saying, go get my, a, a wife for my, do my son from my brother, from his family. Okay? Uh, he's now dwelt in, now he's sending him back to Haran, which is Mesopotamia. Okay, so sometimes you see in the English translation Mesopotamia, or you read in the literature Mesopotamia, he's going back there. Okay, called the city Nekor, which is cha Genesis chapter 24, verse 10. Okay, um, now here, remember, in uh, Genesis 29, verse 4, um, the increase of whose family Abraham had heard a few years ago, and that was Genesis 22, verse 20. He heard that his brother's family had grown, Okay, so that we knew that from the scripture. Now we're in chapter 24. Let's go to the next uh, slide, verse 4. But that you will go to my homeland, to my kinsmen, to choose a wife for my son Yitzhak. Amen? Once again, it's very important to point this out. In here, in this one, he says, choose a wife. Once again, 
the statement speaks against homosexuality because it's opposite speak. The reason I'm dwelling on this, because once we start getting to the laws, the mitzvot that are more, you know, the, the other Torah-based mitzvot, you know, I have to understand this way that God writes the scriptures. Sometimes he writes forward, sometimes he writes backwards, okay? You know, have to know how to read it, okay? This is implied heterosexual behavior, okay? God is not a male woman, God is a man, okay? So here, once again, the word wife in the second verse, because we verse 3 we see the word wife, now we see the word wife again. It is the same word, H802. It is Isha or Nashim. It means number one, woman, wife, female. Number two, woman, opposite of man. So it's implied heterosexual behavior. It is implied, it is against homosexuality behavior. Okay? It's implied that it is heterosexual because get a wife for my son. And finally, last verse, and then we'll close. Because I want, verse 3 and 4, because I want to, you to swear by Jehovah the Elohim of heaven and the Elohim of earth that you will not choose a wife from my son from among the women of the Kenai, among whom I am living, but that you will go to my homeland, to my kinsmen, to choose a wife from my son Yitzhak. Amen? Now, he, this is a very important verse, okay? Because this proves that it's not Ishmael that had come back. Remember, we, I read you some of the Talmud and some of the things that Ishmael came out of the, the, the forest and uh, went with uh, Abraham and Yitzhak to the place of the, the, the offering in Bereshit 22. So here, Jehovah wants it to be clear that a wife for my son Yitzhak, not for Ishmael. Yitzhak is the son of the promise who is now 40 years old. Now here, we want to make sure it's a son. And this will be our final definition for this lesson this evening. Sorry for the crash on uh, YouTube. Um, once again, you can go to our website um, Wednesday, and I will have the full files up because we also, we triple everything here in many different ways of recording, okay? Because we know things can happen technology-wise, but we have a website, and the whole teaching will be up there on, on Wednesday if you miss any part of this. Um, final word is the word son is H1121. It is the Hebrew word ben. Okay? It is number one, son, grandson, child, member of a group. Number two, son, male, child. Okay? So when it says bene, it's sons. Okay? Yod is specific to a man at the end. Okay? So the bene, the men are so where the seats yod, not the women. Okay? So here... Uh, finally, in verse four, 4, but that you will go to the homeland to my kinsman to choose a wife for my son, Yitzhak. Okay? It is his son. Once again, it is not Yishmael because we're seeing, once again, the term son Yitzhak. Okay? This is Abraham speaking. He's calling him his son again. It is there in the scripture. And we're going to end on that. I hope you've learned a lot today. If you had... Send me a little note. Let me know that you learned. I bid you an amen, an amen, and an amen. Shalom. This is Messianic Rabbi Andrew Dinnerman. I would personally like to thank you for tuning in to The Remnant's Call each and every week. You can listen to the full message on our website, bethgoyim.org. If you have drawn closer to the King of Kings, learned more about Him today, we are blessed. If you are blessed by these messages, please consider a donation to our ministry. You can go to our website, bethgoyim.org. That's B-E-T-H-G-O-Y-I-M.org. And click on the donate button. You do not have to have a PayPal account to donate. All you need is a debit card. Once again, thank you very much for listening to the Remnants Call. If you have not taken your first steps to be born again, just ask God's help. Remember, 
It's His loving grace that has come to find you. No one is worthy or able to reach God, but God can reach us, and He's reaching out to you now. Just open your heart and let Him in. His arms are open, and the blessing of salvation and eternal life are waiting for you. Don't let it wait any longer. Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and give you his shalom. Shalom. My name is Messianic Rabbi Andrew Dinnerman, and I invite you to come to visit our congregation. If you are in the tri-state area, come out and visit with us on Shabbat. We are a congregation of Jews and Gentiles, living as one in the Messiah Yeshua. BGMC is a place of true worship. The focus never wanders from the Hebraic roots of our faith. Beth Goyim is rooted in the Word of God from Bereshit through to the book of Revelation. Messiah's strong words against man-made tradition are carefully recorded in Matthew 7. That is the reason we only follow the straight-up instructions found in Scripture, truly the way, the truth, and the life. If you're looking for a deeper walk with Adonai, come out for our Tuesday evening Bible study called Messianic Torah Time. Come, spend the day with us on any Shabbat. We start at 11 a.m. with the sound of the ancient Hebrew shofar. Next, we offer our King praise and worship in English, Hebrew, and Spanish. After worship, we review the headlines in the previous week's news from around the globe, especially news from the Holy Land, Israel. We don't just list the news headlines as current events, but we comb through the scriptures, searching for clues to understand what they mean and then to help pinpoint prophetically our current position on Adonai's clock. After digesting all that modern information, we leave the world behind as we journey with our Adonai deep into his eternal word not with just one or two scriptures, but usually seven or more scriptures. The spiritual nourishment and the richness of his kingdom become accessible to the ones who share this special time and seek them out. The day does not end there. Because Shabbat is so special to him, there is always so much more that our king desires to share. So instead of separating and leaving, we stay together as a family for potluck lunch and an afternoon study of our King's Word. We close the Shabbat together with the reading of the New Week's parasha. That's the Torah portion. Even after those blessings, many of us just can't get enough. So the members bring prepared homemade foods to share while we all enjoy an uplifting movie together. If all that information is not quite enough, you can check out our website where you will find over 200 video teachings and Biblical Holy Day studies. Under Messianic Torah Time, the Hebrew Roots button, you'll discover free studies on many, many different topics, including PowerPoint slide presentations. If Beth Goyim sounds like a place you'd love to visit, but you live outside the tri-state area, there is still a way to connect with us. We stream live on the internet on Tuesday, Thursday, and Shabbat. The website is www.bethgoyim.org. That's B E. T-H-G-O-Y-I-M dot org. Our phone number is 973-338-7800 or 978-2-YESHUA. That's 978, the number 2, YESHUA. Shalom.